So today is our uh, usual Wednesday chance for a Q&A session. So if people have some questions they'd like to discuss or type in the chat, then we can sort of go anywhere with this topic. But I did want to begin um, just uh, while people sort of think about things we can speak about uh, with something that came up on alms round today. So every morning, weekday morning, I go into alms at Pike Place Market in downtown Seattle. And uh, today someone came up and a standard question I usually ask uh, is sort of what people are working with in terms of Dhamma in their week, in their lives. And this uh, person was talking about physical pain and how, uh, how they can approach it and work with it and uh, be with it in a equanimous manner. And this is something that I'll be very curious about others' insights, perhaps during the Zoom session at 6.45, others who have been through greater pain than I can speak to it. But for now, um, the reflections I have found helpful uh, fall in line with the Buddha's encouragements in a sutta, uh, which is addressed to a layman named Nakula Pitta, Nakula's father, who's aging and approaches the Buddha asking how he can come to terms with this failing body of his. And so much of pain is the sense of it uh, being wrong, of it shouldn't be this way, of a, an intrusion and a unwelcome and unwarranted intrusion into our bodies. And this is why I find the Buddha's response to Nikula Pitta so meaningful in that he says, it is true, Nikula Pitta, it is true. Who but about, out of mere foolishness would consider this body healthy even for a moment? This body is encumbered, a burden, and I think he even says burning, perhaps. And this idea that the natural state of the body is not necessarily health, but rather some degree of sickness, you know, in a classic, you know, fashion, it can seem dour in a Theravada sense. And yet I find it's a route towards really alleviating the sense of something's wrong when the body is ill or in pain. Just the understanding that these bodies are unbelievably complex and also in some sense failing and destined to fail and that this is the natural state of things. The other recollection which has helped uh, was just noticing how when we encounter pain, it's a encouragement from the universe and from the body to learn to let go a little bit um, from what will be torn away from us in the end. So many know of the five recollections, uh, which many Buddhists recite to themselves. I'm of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature of die to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And I am the owner of my kama, heir to my kama, born of my kama. So this acknowledgement that we bring to mind regularly of the fact that everything we love will be ripped from us uh, and to prepare for that and how this leads to just a slight stepping back. Longpur Su Chitto defines mindfulness as just hovering one inch above the ground. And that one inch, that slight restraint on a complete identification and attachment with these conditions which are frail and failing around us is the difference between a heart that is breaking constantly in line with those things around it that it's tied itself to that are breaking and a heart that is, uh, in the words of the Buddha, akupa or akupa, uh, akupa, unshakable. So this is just preparing. Um, for what's to come. And in the sense, every encounter with loss, every encounter with sickness and with the failing of the body or other attachments in the world is one way we can conceive of 
the Dharma preparing us for a greater loss. And the Dalai Lama has uh, characterized this practice as one large preparation for death. And this can sound completely dark until you realize that with every act of letting go, the Buddha points us towards something uh, which you're letting go into. And that what you become, it's not that you're empty of all things, you're empty of self, but full of reality. And uh, what we're doing is just preparing ourselves. We visited Ayananda Bodhi and some of the bhikkhunis uh, this last week in Aloka Vihara. And Ayananda Bodhi had this wonderful quote from a, some documentary where she said, here's another cold, hard fact coming straight at you from reality. And I really liked that. And just the idea that when we let go of these attachments, of these clingings, all we're letting go of into is, is into reality. And in that sense, there's nothing to fear. So this applies to the body and to sickness and pain. And, you know, in terms of other practical means of dealing with pain, uh, I think it is worth working with on a variety of levels. Some people find that establishing a place elsewhere in the body where one can uh, develop the sense of pleasure, such as, uh, you know, imagining the breath energy coming through the shoulder blades, through the kidneys, um, up above the head. Uh, this can, if you sort of establish awareness grounded there and then move out towards the place of pain, the knot of pain and touch it as you would a frightened, animal and just stroke it with awareness, but from that place of centered refuge in the body. This can be one uh, helpful approach. The other approach is to go straight to the pain and really watch it. Uh, and instead of simply labeling it as pain and seeing it as this kind of conglomerated mass, try to articulate the exact flavor of the pain. Is it pulsing? Is it vibrating? Is it hot? Is it uh, aching? Is it a dull ache? What sort of musical note would it be? Become interested in it. And you'll find that as each thread of ulterior or different sensation is unraveled from that larger cloth of pain, that the rest of that cloth becomes frayed as well and begins to unravel. And it seems much less intimidating when you begin to articulate with a degree of subtlety and refinement. And uh, the final um, encouragement is to, well, there's a few, you know, spread loving kindness. This is supposed to help with pain. And to also uh, learn to um, contemplate the body. And just the mind is especially willing to see through the body when the body is not a fun place to be. So if you just, contemplate the 32 parts that the Buddha uh, gives us to see through the uh, khanda of the body of form, um, looking at the skin, at the bones, at the nails, teeth, hair, skin. And if, and you, if you bring those things to mind in a meditation, you can watch as the mind will sort of buoy out of uh, its sense of being mired in and trapped by the body. And that's a useful time to recollect in that way. So just some thoughts on pain in a nice optimistic beginner uh, or beginning to this session. So we have some questions. If people would uh, be so kind as to type others in, so we're, we have a few to go on, we'll begin. Dear Ajahn, would you please explain for me the difference between stream entering and stream winning? I had not heard of stream winning until very recently. My sense is that these are just two terms for sotapanna. Um, so it's the same, stream winning and stream entry. And for those who don't know, that's considered the first of the four stages of awakening, um, where the three fetters of the heart, namely uh, self-view, sakayaditi, doubt, vichigicha, and attachment to rites and rituals or methods and practices, sila pata paramasa, are dropped. And uh, this is the first of the ideas that you encounter a state beyond anything experienced before, the deathless. 
and the heart is irreversibly changed after that encounter. Um, it plays into a set of four stratified stages of awakening, stream entry, once returner, non-returner, and arahant um, of increasing refinement. Arahant is full awakening. And those can sound very esoteric and artif artificially created at first, but the best rundown I've ever heard is Longfor Sumedho's where he maps each onto a different strata of the self that's being let go of. So stream entry, you're seeing through all your cultural conditioning from birth onwards. So uh, when you see through Sakaya Diti, that's you identifying with this body, with your name, with your personality. Those are things you gain since birth um, from your conditioning, a man, a woman, um, anything in between. And uh, attachment or methods and practices, the other fetter that's dropped at stream entry is, you know, how we consider things done in our culture and our religion, how we attach to those and give great weight. And um, doubt plays into this as well and seeing through doubt, but that's cultural conditioning. Um, once returner and non-returner, you're beginning to attenuate and then completely letting go of two subsequent fetters, sensual desire and aversion. And these are biological. This is the biological strata of the self. So that's, you know, the sense of lust or uh, desire, um, craving for sensual pleasures. That's something that every biological being or animal possesses. And similarly with aversion, hatred, uh, moving away and pushing away. So with anagami, non-returner, that third stage of awakening, you let go of the biological strata of the self. And then the fourth and final level of awakening, arahantship, full awakening, you let go of conceit, restlessness, desire for the uh, fine material and immaterial realms, and avijja, ignorance. And these are all the strata of self to deal with the mind and heart. It's the most refined strata. So conceit, just this subtle sense of, it's not a coarse conceit, it's the sense of a center. So I find that that's a very useful way of looking at those four stages of awakening, not as sort of an esoteric uh, leveling system, but rather it's very clear that the Buddha was mapping things onto your cultural conditioning, your uh, biological conditioning, and then your mental conditioning in increasing levels of refinement. And I, I do believe I know lay people who have attained stream entry. And in the suttas, there are... Uh, many, many who are said to have, and more up to anagami, non-returner. Um, and then many, many arahants. Um, of course, they say that once you attain full awakening, you do ordain or go forth from the whole life in some way, shape or form. I live with life altering pain and illness, experiencing at least moderate pain every day. Some days pain, nausea, and exhaustion seem to be more than my mind can bear. The heavenly messengers are daily teachers in my practice. I'm sorry, Rick. I think um, Long Sumedho speaks about going to Thailand and being asked by a Thai monk, what our angels look like? And he sort of mentioned they're dressed in white and have harps and wings and he asked what the Buddhist angels look like and the Buddha and the monk said, well, it's yeah, sickness, aging, death. And of course, in the commentaries, you have the monk or the monastic, you know, and, and I don't quite know how to speak always to levels of chronic pain, not having had such chronic pain, but I can say that, those I know who've moved through deep, the deepest pain with dignity and mindfulness, there's a beauty that comes over them and a majesty of spirit that is rare. Just yesterday I was speaking, I went to a funeral and I talked to a, a woman who lost her daughter, um, her small daughter last Jan or February. And she was speaking about how before that she'd been selfish self-absorbed, uh, always comparing her house to others. And then after her daughter had passed, she just couldn't maintain that view anymore. All she saw was the people who'd come 
to help her and be with her. And of course, she also was reflecting that no one, you know, people would say they understood, but they just didn't and they couldn't. And I think that's true. I think probably a mother losing her child is, is a greater loss than almost anything a human being can encounter. But it also made me reflect um, that she was at a different funeral. Uh, we were at a funeral for someone who'd lost her husband. And the fact that she could approach that woman and say that she understood her pain and that woman knew it was true. And in a sense, I've met many who've not faced suffering and their hearts can be a bit like porcelain without a crack. And as the heart cracks, as we move through the first noble truth, uh, comprehending suffering, that is where our compassion moves out of. That's where we're broken opens to others. And this is, I think, is the brilliance of the Buddha beginning the Four Noble Truths with the first of comprehending and turning towards our suffering, because it's a universal and it is something that binds us all and allows us to relate to one all. So when I hear about someone with chronic pain, I, I think if you can conceive, conceive of it as, as really your pathway to compassion and a deeper compassion than you'd have any other way um, without that loss, then, then, then there's a path of grace through that pain. You know, there's a way of moving through the first noble truth to the third of peace and the fourth as well. And I, I wish you the best of luck in that. Question. Oh, what is the role of the brain in Buddhism? Thank you. So the brain uh, and the body are considered, I'd say the brain and the body are, you know, considered kind of the same uh, biological conditioning in Buddhism. And I think uh, recent science bears that out. The amount of nerve endings we have in our stomachs is absurd. And the serotonin system is intimately related to the digestive system. Our well being is tied up with the entire somatic experience. The Buddha spoke about conditions and all these things interacting uh, our bodies, our external conditions, and the chitta, the mind, heart, uh, a different medium of being, which does carry after the body has passed. And the Buddha was very specific in not trying to articulate what that was exactly, the chitta, um, the mind, heart, what carries on, what the sort of strata of karma is. Um, and I think that's because the whole system is a little bit flawed, that question of sort of what goes from body to body, like this little homunculus that jumps. You know, when you move from dream to dream, do you, do you think of what kind of jumps from dream to dream? It's just a new dream. Um, and similarly, when the Buddha was asked what moved from body to body, you know, he spoke about fire craving, he basically said, and, and fire, just as fire lighting from one candle, lighting a new candle. Um, so it was one of those questions that the Buddha just didn't see useful to get into. But what is clear in the Buddhist teaching is that there is something going on apart from the physical body, even though it's affected by the conditions of the physical body. So, uh, you know, what you see is, yes, as people's minds go, as they age, as dementia hits, or if they get sick or tired, um, obviously it affects their states of mind, their abilities, their faculties. And this is why it's so important to practice why, while our faculties are sharp. But what is important too, is to see what happens when a practitioner has their body and their brain begin to fail after having cultivated the heart through meditation. Um, and what you see is a real brightness, which is somehow untouchable. Um, Ajahn Fuang, uh, Ajahn Jeff's teacher, Ajahn Tinnisar's teacher, got in a car accident and his brain got quite uh, injured. And he said, 
you know, sometimes I say things that are silly these days, but that thing that the meditation gave me, that has not changed. Similarly, when Longpur Cha got sick uh, and his mind began to go as well, he would often say things like, look, when I just start to laugh randomly, you don't have to keep laughing with me um, because this is sort of his random bouts of almost hysterical laughter that was completely sort of based on this uh, illness he had in his brain at the time, um, which led to his eventual paralysis and death. He said, you don't have to do that. It's just the brain doing what it does. But the brightness of spirit remains with these people. And, and you see those who have meditated and practiced and cultivated and the mind can fade, but there's still this brilliant light behind it. I think this gives us a lot of heart. It's heartening because a lot of us are going to encounter dementia. And to know that what seems to happen is there's an innocence and humility of spirit that begins to shine through. It's like mist being illuminated by the sunlight at dawn. It's fuzzy, it's vague, but it's bright. And I have seen that. So I think we can take heart in that. And that strength, that inner strength, you cultivate through mindfulness, through the chitta, the mind heart, which by the way, Longpur Suchita says that 80% of what you do at the beginning of practice is strengthening the chitta. Um, it, uh, it, it remains. And in rebirth studies, I believe the median, uh, so they've done uh, many research, uh, a lot of research this at the University of Virginia, a doctor named Dr. Ian Stevenson, where they talk to children who purportedly remember past lives and then verified those stories. Um, and initially I dismissed this as fake science until I, I read some of the literature and it was pretty convincing. There's a book called Life Before Life you can look into. Um, and the median distance between uh, a death and a rebirth was I think six months or so, something like that, or maybe 12 months, I can't remember exactly. And most people did not remember their past lives as children the one factor which helped with memory of a past life was the fact that that person had meditated in the past life. Um, so once again, the Buddha didn't require you to believe in rebirth for practice, but uh, for those of you who do, take heart. If you meditate, you're in good stead and your mind and heart are getting brighter, independent of the brain, but your ability to practice is also conditioned by that brain. Can negative karma from the past lot from past lives manifest in a future human rebirth in such a way that it is impossible for an individual to receive the Dhamma and achieve enlightenment? I don't think so. It's possible. It's different. Um, but there's a series of acts, heinous crimes. The Buddha speaks very clearly about that prevent awakening in this life and mean that after the passing away of the body, the spirit is destined to fall to hell. Um, before, of course, in Buddhism, hell is impermanent. So before rising again, these acts include killing one's parents, uh, causing a schism in the Sangha, uh, intentionally killing an arahant, intentionally causing a Buddha to bleed. I think those four are what I'm remembering right now, actually four. If I'm missing one, people can type it in. Um, and the Buddha was clear that these karmic wounds and scars are so brutal that one cannot attain awakening in this life if one has committed them and one is destined for for a low rebirth for hell before recovering. Um, but after that rebirth in a dark place, after that karma has been worked through, my sense is that by the time one returns to a human rebirth, one can again attain awakening. And I can't think of an exception to that. So uh, for the record, King Ajitasattu, uh, the son of King Bimbasara, a beautiful disciple of the Buddha. He killed his father in a moment of fratricide or patricide, sorry. And he 
you know, whenever we get up in arms about the politicians of today, it's so useful to see how the Buddha interacted with the uh, dire conditions of his own. So King Ajitasattu, after killing his father, came to the Buddha and the Buddha didn't, you know, chase him away. He received him and taught him with kindness. And by the end of the teaching, King Ajitasattu uh, bowed and said, look, I've done something wrong. I've hurt and killed my father, who was a good man. And the Buddha said, one who acknowledges a fault grows in the Dhamma. And that's our duty as Buddhists and as practitioners is to hold that level of equanimity and generosity with the people in our lives. Um, as long as it's not hurting us, you know, in the sense of, you know, we can still draw boundaries. So that's just useful to recollect. And that eventually, because the Buddha was willing to teach him, King Atatasattu sponsored the first council after the Buddha's death when Ajahn Mahakasapa and a thousand arahants gathered together to codify the teachings, to establish different schools, like different monasteries during this period were dedicated to chanting certain sections of the Sutta Pitaka of the Buddha's teachings and remembering them and keeping the lineage of that teaching. So there'd be one monastery for say the Majjhima which was the uh, group of teachings meant to sort of uh, widely convert. Um, the Diganakaya was another um, group who'd chant and preserve that and, uh, and so on. So King Atatasattu did a great good deed, but then he did pass away. And the Buddha was clear that despite that good karma, he did fall to hell. Um, and then uh, the Buddha also said that after that, he would be reborn and because of his good karma, um, attain awakening. So once again, we're getting into that ground of rebirth and such, um, but it is part of the teaching. I'm glad. Hi, Ajahn. Sometimes when I meditate, I get a sudden jolt, an energy shock, shock, the feeling I've been falling and suddenly stopping. It's never harmful. Release, I'm not sleepy. It doesn't happen every time. But over two years of meditation, it still comes up. Why is this? Is it just the energy system? Should be mindful when it happens and ends and go deeper. Or is it something they're trying to stop me? That is a good question. I don't exactly know on that one. Um, there's a state called Upachara Samadhi, neighborhood concentration, which isn't really in the suttas, but it's talked about in the Thai forest tradition. Um, there's Kanaka Samadhi, which is momentary concentration. That's sort of a momentary centering of mind. Upachara Samadhi is called neighborhood concentration. And it's sort of when your mind's able to maintain and remain with an object for 20 minutes at a time or, or something. And then Apana Samadhi, which is uh, in the teaching of the Kruba Ajans, the great teachers, sort of a complete unification. And in Upachara Samadhi, uh, the teachers are very clear that a lot of very strange sensations can come up, such as that falling, such as the body feeling like it's expanding. Um, this is what many of those Thai force teachers map onto the word piti or P-I-T-I -I, rapture. Is sort of these strange sensations. Um, I don't think I've ever heard exactly of the sensation of falling though. And I feel hesitant to give too much advice um, or thoughts on it because I don't really know. Um, but perhaps if you log on to Zoom after this, some others will have insights from their own practice to share with you. I would just say that as the mental landscape quiets, it can become disorienting and the mind can begin to scramble and become quite afraid. Many people lose the breath. And what can be helpful then is to give, because the mental landscape we usually orient ourselves by has faded or really refined, to place awareness very intentionally, continuously, and subtly, subtly on a single continuous object and 
such as the breath at the tip of the nose can be very powerful when you're at that level of quiet. Um, but if you're just, as the meditation deepens, if you remain looking for the breath at the place or level where you were at, sometimes the breath has become more subtle in the meantime and you need to go find it. So you can almost imagine making your point of attention at the nose pointier, go, go more and more narrow and try to keep it very continuous through and past the breaks between the inhale and exhale. And that's kind of giving you an anchor through that landscape of uh, cleared out mental space, which is so intimidating to many. Of course, the other way to approach that is to find a more broad, stable, and continuous, if subtle, object, such as the whole field of the body, or the perception of light, a gentle brightening of the whole visual space, or the nada sound, the sound of silence. And sometimes that can be kind of your anchor. But one way or the other, it helps to acknowledge that as the mental landscape becomes intimidatingly empty, um, the mind will begin to scramble and fall and expand and do wild things. And your job is to remain very carefully with poise upon your object, allowing yourself to trace that thin thread through the temporal realm, uh, through time. You know, it's a bit like tracing, you know, you've wandered into this forest and then suddenly it's complete dark, but you you do have this one thread that you let down behind you and you just need to follow that thin thread of that one object and, and hold to it. And of course, another thing is really to spread, uh, drop in a word of love then, you know, and watch the whole mind brighten. It can make the landscape safer too. Ajahn, I wonder if people we call neurodivergent have in previous lives achieved stream entry and arrived not sharing the interest of neurotypical folks. Do you have any reflections on this? I believe, uh, Christy, that you have, uh, Reverend Christy, that you have more insight into different mental proclivities than I do. And I would be very interested in the Zoom session following this to hear about your thoughts on this. I think it's possible that some people labeled as such might, might be there, but uh, in terms of having achieved stream entry, this level of awakening. But I'd say that that's not, uh, you know, perhaps it's as usual among them as it would be among normal folk. I don't think that positing a correlation necessarily makes sense because previous life stream enterers, um, there's a few cases uh, that I've heard of spoken about in uh, Buddhist circles um, by senior teachers. One is of a former um, fashion designer of the queen um, of Thailand. And, you know, she was born extremely, uh, you know, intelligent, uh, into a very good family, would enjoy going to the opera in Europe, would design clothes for the queen. And then she went to a teaching by a Kruba Ajahn. Um, uh, what we call Kruba Ajahn means sort of a well-practiced master in Thailand. And I think he gave one teaching and then he was like, I think spraying uh, holy water, which is something the teachers do in Thailand. And he said, if I think he invited her to come to the next teaching he would give in Bangkok or something like that. And she said, I don't want to come to the next teaching. I want to come and ordain at your monastery. So that was it. She left. Um, she gave up everything. Uh, she moved into a little shack out in this monastery in the middle of nowhere. And a few months Later, the queen came and visited her and was just blown away by this woman living with nothing uh, in this little hut um, who she'd known for so long as having this enormous wardrobe and all that as a fashion designer and she had nothing. And she's her practice has been praised by many adjuncts and she's still alive. She's still alive. And I've heard uh, 
at least one very trusted teacher say that this is an example of uh, a previous life Sotapanna. Um, you know, that when they're reborn, sometimes they can uh, perhaps, you know, they won't be perfect. Um, perhaps some small lie will come out when they're a very young child or something, but that there'll be an enormous reaction to it. And as soon as they kind of wake up again in this life, encounter the Dhamma again, and uh, sort of re move back into that stream that uh, they'll once again have that quality of say perfect morality sila. But this is all speculation and um, I don't know around this, but uh, sometimes it brings up faith to re remember that there are beings in the world who have achieved awakening and whether or not there are past lives and future lives for those who have trouble believing in such things, to know that there are beings that pure, um, that dedicated, who move towards a path of awakening with that sort of sincerity is heartening. And I think there's something we would call love when you hear that, at least for me there is, um, and awe. It's been a pleasure seeing everyone. We have a Zoom session now. Um, please join us if you want. I'm gonna push the link here into the Zoom chat. And uh, if you don't see the link or can't get it, just go to clearmountainmonastery.org, scroll halfway down the page, and you'll see this link to our Zoom session, and we'll get a chance for some more intimate conversation there. So it's great to see everyone. And uh, as always, we hope to see you more and very grateful for this community.